So last week we, um, we talked about Muslim beliefs, right, and, and, and practices. This week we're going to talk about history, and I'm going to admit at the outset we're going to move pretty quickly so that I can get to the modern world and you can ask questions, right? But we can't get to the modern world without some history, and that's, that's what we have to do. Um, so if I skip over a bunch of stuff, then you'll understand I'm having to skip it because we just can't do it all. This is normally a semester course, so. <laughs> but I do think it's important to start with the world of Muhammad, the world into which he is born. And in, he's born in 570 Christian era, common era, we would say historically now, we don't say the Christian era, the common era. And in 610 of the common era, he had his first revelation. So that would mark the beginning of Islam. He was in the Arabian Peninsula in the neighborhood of Mecca, modern-day Mecca. And at that time, that peninsula was surrounded by empires, the Christian Byzantine Empire to the northeast, the Christian Roman Empire to the west across the Mediterranean, um, but also encompassing Egypt and North Africa at this time, and the Persian Sassanid Empire to the far east. Effectively, these empires, the Roman West, the Byzantine East, the Sassanid Persian Empire to the Far East had reached a stalemate. They'd fought each other for many, many years over territory. They had reached a stalemate and in some cases were in decline. So this is a map that you can see of the, the, Arab, the Arab Peninsula is green. The Sassanid Empire, the Persian Empire is yellow. The Byzantine Empire is purple. And then you have a sort of an area down there, pink and south. This is areas not under any effective political control. So, although very importantly, that um, red country down there, the middle center, is um, the, the old kingdom that becomes uh, Ethiopia and Eritrea. And it's important for Muslims because when they were a persecuted minority in Saudi Arabia, Muslims fled there. Okay. Um, so, what about Muslims and Christians? Well, Islam begins with the revelation of the Quran in 610, okay? He recites the revelation and he gets followers, but the followers are persecuted in Mecca because they are against idolatry and Mecca only exists as a cult and trade center around idolatry. So, it's not popular. As a result, some of his followers with Muhammad's, um, with a letter from Muhammad, travel across the uh, Red Sea to Ethiopia and settle there. The king of Ethiopia accepts them, sends his greetings to Muhammad, um, and they uh, form a, a small community there in Ethiopia. The, the long-term thing that's interesting here is that Muhammad, as a leader of this group, forms a treaty with the Abyssinian emperor, the Ethiopian king, really, um, of mutual friendship. It is the only treaty in Islamic history that is permanent. All others would develop to be, you could have a treaty for 10 years and then you've got to renegotiate. But Mo Mo Muhammad's uh, treaty with the Abyssinian king is a permanent treaty of friendship between Muslims and Christians. Muslims and Jews. Well, between 620 and 622, groups of Bedouins from Yathrib, Yathrib is a city to the north of Mecca, about 80 miles. Um, the the uh, groups of these Bedouins from Yathrib uh, can become con converts to Islam. Okay, uh, there are also Jews there that learn about Islam. Um, I was telling the men's group this may seem incongruous to us, but Jewish people lived everywhere in the Middle East in the seventh century of the Common Era, and Jewish tribal groups lived in the Arabian Peninsula. They were Bedouins, just like everybody else. They spoke Arabic, but they traced their religious ancestry to Judaism. They were Jews, okay? Um, which gets us to an aside very quickly. There's often this thing about Allah, the word Allah, what does it mean, okay? Jews used the word Allah for God before Muhammad ever did. It's just the Arabic word for God. Arabic-speaking Jews used it. Arabic-speaking Christians used it. Muhammad used it in the Quran. Period. That's all there is to say about it. Modern Arabic Christians use the word Allah for God. Modern Arabic-speaking Jews use the word Allah for God. 
It's only a controversy in the United States because we don't speak Arabic. Okay. So, in 622, the Meccans, uh, a group of Muhammad's followers, migrate to Yathrib. Um, they settle there. Muhammad is, becomes the leader of a tribal confederation over Yathrib. And at this period, everything is fine <laughs> um, uh, between Muslims and Jews. They're part of the tribal confederation. Okay. However, rather quickly, conflicts break out. In 624 and 625, two of the Jewish tribes want to rebel against Muhammad's rule in Yathrib. They want to leave the tribal confederation. Um, this results in their being expelled from Yathrib. So Yathrib is an oasis, right? You, there's a watering hole. Basically, those two Jewish tribes are expelled. In 627, the third of the three Jewish tribes takes this, that has remained in Mecca, takes the side of an invading Bedouin group, in other words, an invading Arab group that's trying to take over the, uh, the oasis, okay? And um, as the invaders are defeated, so uh, the Jewish tribes are defeated with them. And it is in this period of time that Muhammad receives a series of revelations that allow him, because remember there was a tribal confederation, right? You're all supposed to get along. So these revelations from God allow Muhammad, because the Jews have broken their promise first, to wage war against them and to destroy them. Okay, so the so-called verses of the sword all date to this period in Mecca when Muhammad is putting down a Jewish rebellion aided by outside forces. Okay. Um, at the same time, by the way, up until this time, Muslims had prayed toward Jerusalem. Um, now Muhammad gets a revelation that they should pray towards Mecca. Okay, so the revelation rather conveniently, at a time you're at war with the Jews, also devalues the Jewish cultic center, which you had used before as the direction of prayer. Okay. From this period forward, Islamic rulers begin to have two Quranic traditions to draw on in relating to Jews. The earlier traditions are very friendly towards Jews and Christians. This media, medium traditions from Mecca are very unfriendly towards Jews. Later in Muhammad's lifetime, the, repair, the relations with the Jewish tribes would be repaired. They were too important as fellow traders. And as a result, we would have later verses that go back to the positive idea that Muslims must protect Jewish sites and protect Jewish lives. So, but if you're just reaching into the Quran, you will find both traditions. Does that make sense? Okay. Um, as, a, as a matter of fact, actual Muslim-Jewish relationships varied from time to time and place to place. Generally, Jews maintained their independence under Muslim empires. Uh, their sort of ethnic independence, legal independence. They were often very important roles in finance and trade uh, for Muslims. Muslims, like Roman Catholics, could not loan money at interest. Um, Jews cannot loan money at interest to each other, but they can to Muslims and Christians. So this made Jews natural international financiers. And because they had widespread trade networks, a Jewish loan written in Medina could be cashed in China, right? So, so be, um, and by the way, it went both ways. Muslims couldn't loan money to Muslims at interest, but they could loan money to Jews at interest. So you can see how it's going to work, right? Jews will loan money to Muslims. Muslims will loan money to Jews. They can't, because they can't loan within the community. Um, so they would, in fact, become important, incredibly important finance and trade partners because of this mutual thing that they could do across the trade routes. What about Muslims and Christians? Well, in the time of Muhammad, there was actually very little contact with Christians aside from this one trip to Abyssinia, okay? Um, the Quran tells Muslims that Christians are the closest to them in affection. Of all the world's peoples, the Christians are the closest to the Muslims, according to the Quran. At the same time, the Quran warns Muslims against Christian belief in the Trinity and says that Jesus did not really die on the cross but was taken up alive into heaven. So the, the Quran talks about Jesus' death on the cross but says that at the last moment God took him off. Actually, the Quran actually says he died. The Muslim interpretation says the word died in this one instance in the whole Quran doesn't mean died. It means taken up into heaven by God. Okay? 
So we can, the Muslim exegetes can worry about that, okay? So it's a mixed bag. On one hand, Muslims must, must accept and protect Christians as, worship, as fellow worshipers of God. They're obliged to protect Christian holy places and mosques. They must honor Jesus as a prophet, okay? But they have to reject most of what Christians teach about Jesus. Does that make sense? So it's a mixed bag. In fact, with the relation of Muslims and Christians and Jews, it's a mixed bag. That's a good way to put it. Historically, when they can get along, they get along just fine. And they can find reasons to get along in their scriptures. If they're not getting along, they can go right back to their scriptures and find reasons to not get along. Okay? So, some early Muslim expansion. This is uh, the expansion of the, under Muhammad and his first four successors. You will see how the uh, Muslim empire explodes out of the area of Mecca and Medina in the Arabian Peninsula, conquers a substantial part of the Byzantine Empire in what is what we call the Middle East, conquers a substantial part of the Persian Sassanid Empire, and in North Africa conquers a substantial part of the European-based Roman Empire. But remember the Romans, Rome controlled the North Africa. It was Catholic in those days. Okay. So empires are colliding. By the, by the time of the uh, end of the first four caliphs, Muslim armies, as Islam, these Arab armies, right, expanding out of Saudi Arabia vigorously, are in conflict with all three, two Christian empires and one Persian empire. And it has to be said, they're winning. And for that, for that reason, from the, from the beginning of the seventh century onward in time up until today, the primary way in which Muslims would relate to Christians and Jews was they would be in one form of imperial war or another. Empires would be expanding or contracting. But for all of the idealism in the Quran, the reality would be on the borders was always conflict. Now within, not so much. Okay. So what did it look like to be a Christian or a Jew in the Muslim empire? The Muslims, by the way, were not only not obliged to make Christians and Jews convert, they were forbidden from making them convert because they, they were fellow monotheists. They were obliged to force idolaters to convert, but Christians and Jews were not obliged to convert. So as these Muslim empires expanded into Christian territory and into areas with large numbers of Jews, you, quickly you've got Christians and Jews living within the Muslim empire. And what did that look like? Well. For one thing, the Muslims were good at army and bad at administration. So when they took over these areas, they just took over the existing administrative structures of the Byzantine Empire, the Roman Empire, the Sassanid Empire, and those administrative structures were full of Jews and Christians. So it's very possible that a Muslim city in the 8th or 9th century, two-thirds of all the bureaucrats would be Christians and Jews. The military commander would be Muslim. In fact, the Muslims were desperately worried about the way that Christians and Jews in these cities would pervert Islam. So they built their own military camp cities to keep the Arabs away from the Christians and Jews. So, for example, Cairo started as a military camp. The great city of Egypt was Alexandria. The modern city of Cairo was started basically to keep Muslim soldiers away from Christians and Jews. Okay? lest they be perverted, right? Um, and so what happens is a three-level society develops. Arab Muslims are at the top. The military leaders, the armies are Arab Muslims, okay? Non-Arab converts are next. So after a century or two, by the way, Muslim, uh, Christians and Jews had to pay a tax that the Arabs didn't have to pay, Muslims didn't have to pay. So let's say you're not such a big believer. You go, you know what, if I converted, <laughs> I wouldn't have to pay a tax. This actually became such a big problem that Muslim rulers began forbidding conversion because it was eating in their tax base. <laughs> Remember, they had conquered huge swaths of Christian farmers and stuff. There were no Muslim farmers. There was no Muslim tax base. Muslims were all armies, soldiers. Soldiers get money. They don't pay taxes. So, but nonetheless, conversion did happen. Conversion gradually happened. These areas would gradually convert to be Muslims. But these converted Muslims, who all took the name or a name somewhere in their name of Abdullah, these, con these converted Muslims 
were definitely a lower class than the pure Arab Muslims, right? And then at the bottom would be the non-Muslims in the hierarchy, no matter what job they had in government, and it might be a fairly high job, okay? Non-Muslims all continued to live according to their own legal traditions in matters not directly related to the conduct of the state. So the ideal um, is spelled out in the time of the Umayyad and Ibasid dynasty of a city, a Muslim city, is it has four quarters. There's a Muslim quarter, a Persian quarter, a Jewish quarter, and a Christian quarter. The Christians, day-to-day -day living, live under a bishop. They might never see a Muslim ruler, they might not even care about a Muslim ruler. Jews live under the chief rabbi. Okay. Um, why is this? Because in these days, the, the state, the empire, the Muslim state, really only did three things. It waged war, it collected taxes, and it governed international trade. Everything else was up to the local community. So family law, all these big areas of law that we consider, family law and all of this stuff, was going to be managed by Christians for Christians, by Jews for Jews, by Persians for Persians, frankly, among Muslims, by local tribal leaders for Muslims. Islamic law recognized early on that local tribal laws were valid as long as they didn't contradict the Quran. Because these conquering Arabs didn't want to be running marriage licenses for some little village that had done it on their own for 2,000 years. Leave it to the tribal elders to sort that out. We don't, that's not our business. What's our business if we're a Muslim conqueror? We make war, we collect taxes. We try to make sure foreign trade can take place because that's how we make money. Okay, it's very different than the way we imagine. Well, no, it's very different than the way the, mo you know, I mean, we have modern day total libertarians that imagine a government that only does that. They're all on my Facebook page, by the way. <laughs> but, <laughs> but in the real world, as you know, if you want to, say, put in a sprinkler system, you have to consult with a higher level of government. Okay, not, not in those days. So, um, here we have the further expansion of the Muslim empire, just to give you an idea, up to, up to the middle of the 8th century of the Common Era. Um, this light green areas are where the Umayyad dynasty is going to expand the Muslim empire. You notice they take over all of Spain. Spain is Muslim from the 8th century to the 15th century. Ferdinand and Isabel will send Columbus to discover the Americas and they will expel the last Muslims from Spain at the same time that they expel all the Jews from Spain. Okay, where are all those Jews going to go live? Well, they're not going north. They're going south into Muslim territory. Okay, um, to continue on, we have the beginning of Islam's conflict. Islam takes over all of the Persian empires you can see to the east. You will see that they begin to have encounters with Christian Europe, the area in red. So the purple area is the Byzantine Eastern Empire. The area in red is the Christian Roman Empire. You can see parts of Italy have been co are controlled by Byzantium. The pink areas are areas of conflict, and it's in this period of time um, between the 8th and the 9th centuries that Harun al-Rashid begins to have conflicts with Charlemagne, the Christian emperor, on the borders of Spain and France. Um, and many a famous battle is fought that keeps the Muslims from advancing further into Europe from the south there, and the Byzantines are holding off the Muslims to the east. Okay. Mutual benefits. Through trade and through scholarly networks of Christians and Jews, Muslims that crossed imperial borders, Islamic, Christian, Jewish civilizations, interact in many ways that are fruitful for Christians. Muslims have conquered the great Greek libraries of Alexandria. They have direct access to many works that were lost to the Christians. Works of Greek philosophy, drama, poetry, etc. So in the 8th and 9th century, Christian scholars in Europe are learning Arabic so they can read Arabic translations of Aristotle. They don't have them available in the original languages, although we know now that those originals were in the Vatican Library. They just couldn't get to them. The way they were getting to them was through Arab scholars. Arabs would borrow from Christians. The Arabic word for philosophy is falsafa. There's no Arabic word until they bump into Greek. So Arabic scholars, by the way, are learning Greek. They're deeply imbibing Greek culture. 
they will become Neoplatonists, believe it or not. Muslim spirituality is Neoplatonic spirituality. So it's not like it's all one way. There's this huge fruitful thing going on, okay? Um, for many centuries, Muslim scientific advances and mathematical advantages advances are moving much more quickly than Christianity. Christianity's in the dark ages now. Islamic is an ascendant empire. It has scholars, they have the freedom, they're looking, they're building on Greek works that are unknown in Europe at this point. So if you wonder why so many words that we use in math like algebra are Arabic words, it's because the Muslims are way ahead. Navigation, medicine, mathematics, Muslims are the leaders at a time that Europe is in the Dark Ages. Um, and those ideas are going forth. Again, people like, um, people like Johannes Kepler, uh, Tycho Bach, and others are learning to read Arabic so they can get hold of Muslim astronomical works. So it's very different than we might imagine. Um, by the way, though, <laughs> I always want to, because there's a whole Muslim thing about how we were ahead of you always, we invented European civilization, and then you guys took all the credit. Well, that's not exactly true either, right? It's, it's never that. Th there was always this mixing, intellectual mixing on the borders. Even as people fought, ideas traveled, okay? But to say, oh, we did it for you or you did it for us, it's, it's really not an accurate historical assessment, okay? Good, po good polemics and politics, but bad history, okay? So uneasy neighbors. I want to characterize Muslims, Christians, and Jews as uneasy neighbors. Within Muslims' lands, Christians and Jews were sometimes scapegoats. When things got bad, it was easy for a Muslim ruler to blame the Christians and the Jews that lived among them. Okay? Um, Muslims generally could not live permanently in Christian lands. Muslims were expelled from Christian lands on a regular basis. Jews could, but they were persecuted. But Muslims could not live in Christian lands at all. Moreover, both Christians and Muslims had imperial ambitions. They all wanted to expand into new territory, and so they were always going to always be bumping up against each other. This was a period in which economic expansion was the expansion into new landed territory where there was more agriculture. So there was always going to be a conflict over territory. Um, war, and both, by the way, both Christians and Muslims believed that they had a universal religious truth to spread. Jews did not, by the way. Jews have never believed that they needed to spread their truth universally. It was for the Jews. Right? But Muslims and Christians were both universalizing religions, caught up in imperial ideas about expansion of territory. They were naturally going to conflict. War was not inevitable, but it was frequent, and it was almost always over territories and trade. Um, and we get to this thing about the treaties. So Muslims, um, not, a, not the Quran, but an early tradition of the Prophet Muhammad says that you shall wage war, and if you have to have a treaty, it'll only be for 10 years, renewable, okay? Now, what happened was, as Muslim and Christian armies fought themselves to a stalemate and war became bad business, these treaties just got continued on and on and on, right? 10 years, let's check with each other. Yeah, war's still a bad idea. Let's do another 10, okay? Of course, occasionally you get to the point where 10 years passes and one side thinks it's stronger than the other and says, no, we're back at it. Okay, but if you actually look at the period from the 8th century until the 15th or 16th century, 95% of the years were years of peace between Muslims and Christians. The years of war were very minuscule relative to the years in which they got along just fine. So, the end and a new beginning. The decline of Muslim power in the 16, from 1600 to 1970 and the formation of new empires. To really understand the modern world, we now have to go back to the beginning of the modern era. A new Europe begins to emerge from the Reformation in the 16th century. A new Christian empires begin to arise. The old Holy Roman Empire is going to coalesce, coalesce over a period of three or four centuries into Germany. The Dutch, small as they are, will become a major naval power. France will become the greatest imperial power in the world. England will rival it, okay? These empires would be based on sea power. And Spain, by the way, after Ferdinand and Isabel, rises again. They're based on sea power. And so they would directly engage the Muslim world on all its borders, not just the Mediterranean basin, because ships are now 
it's not just, we're not just fighting with this little border in the Balkans or the border across the Straits of Gibraltar in the Mediterranean world. European sea power is now taking it to the south where it's meeting the southern borders of the Muslim empire. Does that make sense? Okay. Not in big ways, but all the time. The keys to the power. Why is it that Europe is doing this? Out of centuries of war, internal wars, the Hundred Years' War, the Thirty Years' War, Europeans pioneered new and far more efficient ways of organizing military power and deploying it against their enemies. There's nothing like being at war to make you better at doing it. The Muslim world had been in a period of three centuries of peace. It had become not good at war. In fact, in the 17th and 18th century, the Ottoman Empire would be actively hiring French generals and military advisors to get it up to date, uh, which is one reason France has such a long tie in the Middle East and Turkey, is because every educated, every educated Muslim soldier had to speak French, right? So um, these ties, but, but it's because they're, they're not good at war. Europe is becoming very good at war. Military de power depended on far more efficient government. You need really efficient government to deliver goods to the troops and to make sure that everybody works as efficiently as possible. European governments from the time of Martin Luther on were, were becoming much better at governing. And I don't just mean they had more power. I mean they used less resources to create more resources. A relatively small government was creating bigger economies was able to draw off more taxes, create bigger standing armies, create bigger and bigger ships. You should look at the distant difference in a hundred years that European ships went. The Nina, the Pinta, and the Santa Maria would fit in your sanctuary. 150 years later, you couldn't fit this whole, this whole plot of land would fit in a Spanish man of war. It's exponentially bigger ships. The Nina, the Pinta, and the Santa Maria carried small, th three small guns. And when I say small, I mean this long, this big round. Okay? 150 years later, a Spanish man of war would carry 90 guns that could throw in a single thing at one time 14 tons of metal. I don't think we even imagine what these sea battles are like. Can you imagine? Boom, and 14 tons of metal flies into the next ship. Boom, 14 tons flies back. Okay? Um, it's, it's almost humorous to look at the pictures by the Muslims in Malacca of the Portuguese man of wars at war with their little parahus. Because they draw the, and these, by the, these, by the way, that was the, fifth, that was the early 16th century. The Portuguese men of war were not that big. But they were almost literally 15 or 20 times longer and carried 100 times more soldiers than the Malays could put in a boat. It wasn't even a contest. It wasn't even conscious. They didn't even have to fire their guns. They just ran over the Malay boats. Okay? So that's happening. By the way, though, to fuel these empires, you need more stuff. Right? The days of expanding to buy, get more agricultural land are gone. Everybody's landlocked. You now need to be importing stuff on these big ships. Gold, but everything else as well. And so that means you have to build colonies. You're going to have to go in other places and get stuff. Okay, so more about decline. Trade. European sailing vessels grew larger and more capable. European sailors pioneered navigational techniques that allowed them to sail across the ocean, not just around the coast, so they could go to the New World and everything that that had in it. Okay. Um, trade, by the way, so the, the astrolab, the first navigational instrument that could be used for the sea, was invented by Muslims. But every subsequent advance would be European. Okay, including the, the vexatious problem of latitude and how to build better and better clocks so that you could keep track of this. Okay, trade over the old Silk Road, which had been the major trade generator of wealth from the east traveling west, is now eclipsed by sea power. Ships, instead of ships of the desert, <laughs> real ships could carry way more stuff, way safer, way faster, even going around the tip of Africa or Cape Horn, than could camels, okay? So Muslim control of the old land routes was irrelevant. 
These arrows point to places that Europeans are in confl conflict with Muslims. They are all important ports of trade that give access to Asian goods. Europeans did not have to capture huge masses of land. They just had to capture the one port. They just had to have control of the sea lanes to have control. Beyond trade, a new world economy is developing, and it's being shaped by European wealth and industry, not by Muslims anymore. Right? The Muslim world was the heartbeat of the world economy up until the 14th century because of the trade back and forth with Asia. With the discovery of the Americas and seaborne trading, it's now going to be European wealth and industry that are going to be shaping a worldwide economy. And European industry demanded two things that changed the way that humans were understood in Europe and nationwide and worldwide. One, the European economies needed cheap commodities produced on an industrial scale outside of the structure of feudal agriculture. Feudal agriculture was not efficient enough not to feed the new industrial European nations. They needed industrial agriculture. Now, they couldn't break down the system within Europe, but they could move to new places and set up new systems. Slave plantation labor in the New World, in the American South, would produce the vast amounts of cotton necessary to field, feed England's mills. That's why the Confederates were, the Confederates, the South, that's us, much anyway. Um, that's why they were allies with England, and England was allies with them, okay? because England needed that cotton. And that cotton and the sugar cane that made rum could only be produced by huge plantations run by slaves. Second thing is, once you produce all this industrial output, you need someone to buy it. So a new definition of human comes about, and I want you to think about this, but not very long. We become producers and consumers. For Muslims, and for much of the world, it was degrading. It was degrading. I don't produce and consume. I live in the great chain of being. I'm a farmer. I'm not a, I'm not a commodity producer, right? But we've become, so, we, in Europe, we became so shaped by these ideas that we even have a book called Consumer Reports, <laughs> formed by the Consumer Union, the union of people who buy stuff. <laughs> Whoa, that's who I am, look. Can you tell? Well, no, okay, don't look. So I got this at a secondhand stop in England. But uh, yeah, these are from a sale out at Wranglers. Anyway, but yeah, we become producers and consumers. Pretty soon we're labor, consumption. We developed ideologies around labor and consumption, capitalism, socialism, all of which are around a new human identity. We're not Christians. We're not blacksmiths. We're not all of that. We're just generic laborers and generic consumers. Everybody's after our market share. Okay, the empire of the spirit. The final thing is that, that's gonna nail this is in the 19th century, Europeans became vigorous promoters of Christianity. And with the intention and with the stated intention, I want to be very clear on this, of wiping out every religion in the world except Christianity. I want us to be clear. Roman Catholic Church, the Protestant churches, United Methodist Church and its antecedents, their goal in the 19th century was to make the entire world Christian, period. And that was stated publicly at every possible level. Robert Speer, the Yale movement, we will win the world for Christ in our generation, okay? Or today, the 1040 window movement, anyway. that. When Muslims realized that actually the intention of the European colonizers was not just to take their stuff, but was to actually destroy their religion and culture, they got irritated. Well, you can imagine Christians get irritated when other people try to destroy our religion and culture. I mean, we're not, by the way, we're not the only bad guys here. The Muslims went into India with every intention of turning all of India into Muslim, Islam, right? Because these were universal imperial religions. The intention was to make everybody the same. We now have learned maybe to talk to each other. You can all go to that thing, right? But let's remember, 120 years ago, we were convinced we'd do it. I have a map from the Muslim World Youth Movement in 1975. So this is a, the Islamic world's a little resurgent at that time, floating on Arab Saudi oil money. Muslims are feeling pretty confident. I don't think they hand this map out anymore. In light of 911, it doesn't look so good anymore. But it's a map that has the world today 
and it shows the Islamic countries in green, right? And then the rest of the world is red. And then it goes, the world of 2000, and it's all green. Right? So I just, Christians aren't the only one to have played this, we will dominate the world with our religion thing. Just FYI. Okay? Across the Muslim world, people, especially Muslims, find that they're one regarded as barbarian. That was insulting. Remember, in the Dark Ages, the Muslims were the ones that were civilized. One of the greatest Muslim conquerors, Timur Ilang, came to Constantinople, looked at the city, and said, totally not worth taking. And that was the greatest city in Christian Europe at the time. And he said, not even worth it. London was a village at this time. Paris was pretty good, but when we go to the great European cities, that all comes about after this revolution, right? Okay, so being called barbarians, Muslims go, no, we're the civilized ones, you were the barbarians. Okay, the result is you begin to have rebellions, and these are rebellions that will arise for all kinds of reasons, political circumstances, economic circumstances, but the Muslim world would find itself at war with European colonialism on many different fronts for many different reasons. Okay, and you can see why if you look at this map, everything that's not a solid color is a Muslim country dominated by European colonialism. Okay, the whole Islamic world, in other words, with the exception, with the sing sole exception of Turkey and Saudi Arabia, the whole Muslim world was under colonial domination. Under colonial domination, it's going to be reshaped. Its societies are going to change in those ways. It changes are consequent for us. First, new forms of communication. The Suez Canal opens up. The telegraph is invented. We Europeans and Americans think of, wow, the trains, right? We're communicating faster, so we're Muslims. Ideas could spread across the Muslim world as fast as they could spread across the Christian colonial world. All of a sudden, Muslims who had taken months to talk to each other can talk to each other in literally seconds. Um, new means of communication, new speed of communication means new means of communications. Newspapers pop up all over the place. Muslims begin to become literate. They can read new ideas. That's going to change everything. Before, if you were a Muslim and you got a new idea, it's because your teacher in the village heard it from the teacher in the town, who heard it from the teacher in the city, who heard it from the teacher who made the pilgrimage to Mecca. And it might take 50 years before you got the latest ideas down in the village. Now you're opening a newspaper in a coffee shop and the one guy in the village that can read is saying, listen to what happened in Cairo yesterday. That's a huge change. And by the way, it's gonna mean <laughs> that you get new social classes. I'm gonna skip over nationalism. First, Muslims begin to think of themselves as members of national groups as opposed to just being Muslims. Nationalism is gonna arise as a, as a uh, as an answer to European colonialism. Secondly, you have new social classes. Journalists become important. All the early Muslim reformers were either journalists or teachers, not imams, not religious scholars, because the imams and religious scholars hadn't mastered the new means of communication. It was journalists who knew how to write this stuff. I keep telling this by people at the theological school. You morons are writing books. What people read is blogs. No, in all seriousness, my last book, published book by Orbis, 2013, okay, has yet to sell 600 copies. And it's considered a very good seller in the academic market for mission studies. Any one of my best five blogs gets 15,000 readers. How am I gonna reach more people? Writing an academic book for an academic press or writing a blog? Writing an academic book is like taking stuff and throwing it into the trash can and hoping someone finds it later. Okay, I'm just saying, same thing's happening. Journalists become the masters of Islam because they have mastered the means of communication. Neo-colonial politicians, if you were a local guy that sucked up to the colonists, then you could put yourself in a position of power. Capitalists, in a capitalistic economy, people who accumulated capital and understood the economy become powerful. Western educated bureaucrats, scientists, engineers, modern educated doctors, these will be the new social classes that will shape Islam. The educated classes because they're the classes that are important in this new world economy. And finally you're going to get Islamist movements, you're going to have pushback movements, you're going to have Muslims that are going, 
We've got to push back against all this and restore things. And the three things that we have here, national, the rise of nationalism, the rise of new social classes, and the pushback Islamist movements are going to be shaping the modern world, the Muslim world, in the late 19th and early 20th centuries. Okay. Uh, I'm going to skip some stuff because I don't... Remind me how much time I have? Yeah, a little time. Whoa, okay, we got lots of time then. You'll see last, you get to ask questions, okay? So, um, one of the things that we need to understand is that in the Muslim world, in the Christian world, modernity began to come. We now, in the academic world, we talk, talk about early modernity. Early modernity is the 13th and 14th centuries, okay? So modernity has been sneaking through the Western world for about 500, 600 years. And we've been getting used to it. Okay? We, we've figured out how we're going to place ourselves as Christian people, as religious people, in the modern world. We don't all agree on how to do that. We Methodists are currently in St. Louis having a fight about this. I understand the Presbyterians have had their own little 20th century fight. Okay? But basically, we've been figuring out modernity for a few hundred years. Modernity came to the Muslim world like that. Muslims are still struggling with what it means to be in a part of the modern world. Right? And by the way, it didn't come organically from within. It came from without. It came with colonialism. Okay? So, Muslims have developed different responses to modernity. What it means for them. The rise of the modern nation state the rise of new ideas, the rise of new forms of communication, the rise of the individual. All of that is something that Muslims are coming to grips with now and have been for the last hundred years. And I'm going to sketch some of the responses. One response that comes about in the late 19th century is what would eventually, they, these all have different names, but we're going to call them the modernists. The modernists are Muslims that say the reason the Muslim world is weak is it's not modern enough. We're, we're, we're still stuck in the past, we need to get up with it. We need to have modern education, we need to teach modern science, we need to speak English or our national language, right? We need literacy, we need to get with modernity. And that means, by the way, we need to have modern nation states. Empires are not the way people organize anymore, right? And we need democracy, because that's the way modern nation states organize themselves. So you have the modernists, then you have the pietists. The pietists are almost the opposite of the modernists. Well, they're not the opposite. In a way, pietists are modernists who say, I can live with the modern world, but let me keep my religion. Okay, let me just keep my religion. The modern world can go on out there. I may interface with it because I'm going to go to work, right? But let me keep my religion. And so the community builds a wall around itself and says, outside's the modern world. We can deal with that sometimes, but the rest of the time we want to live in our world. And so we will adopt our Islamic law and stuff to the local circumstances as far as we can so that we can live like Muslims in the midst of a big modern world. And by the way, we'll build private Islamic schools so we can keep our children away from those corrupt public schools. Um, if that sounds familiar, well, that's because Christians are doing the same thing, right? Um, but yeah, for every new Christian school in the Dallas-Fort Worth area, there's a new Muslim school as well. And they are both being built for the same reason. We don't want our children in public schools. Why? Because we think public schools are corrupt, non-religious, whatever. Okay, of course, if everybody pulls out, that's what they become. But um, other modern responses. What's called, what I call local, local and orthodox. There's, a, there's a, one Muslim response is to say, we just want the good old days back when we had an empire, when everything was good, right? Let's go back, and they call that orthodoxy, right? Let's have the good old days. Let's put back in place all of the old structures, all of the old ideas, because we lived well then, we Muslims. And by the way, we got along with Christians and Jews. No conflict. But then you've got the Puritans. So the, the, the modernists are saying on one extreme, we need to get modern in order to survive. And the Puritans are saying, all our problems come from not being pure enough and being too modern. We need to go back to the pure Islam of Muhammad. Not the great, the Orthodox are saying, let's remember the Abbasid Empire. The Puritans are going, it was corrupt too. <laughs> we got to go right back to the most Puritanical roots of this. And it is the Puritans, as you might well imagine, that are the most problematic 
in relation to the larger modern world overall. Because they're trying to create an imagined paradise, right, that existed 10 years after Muhammad died, and that was in the middle of a desert with very few people. How do you do that in New York City? Okay. So, the Puritans are, tend to follow three strategies that are not mutually exclusive. One is a political strategy. Muslims influenced by national political parties try to establish Islamic states or societies. The Muslim Brotherhood in Egypt is the best known international example of this, but there are many. There's no Muslim country that does not have a political party saying, let's go back. Let's, let's, we'll work in a modern political framework, but we'll use the modern political framework to create an Islamic state. And this is the complaint about the Brotherhood, is that it will work through a democratic electoral process, but as soon as it has gained power, it does away with democracy and returns to a kind of a monarchy, right? Um, which, by the way, they've proven themselves quite capable of doing, and that's why the military kicked them out in Egypt. Very difficult now because what it means is that those of us who support democracy are supporting a group that is democratic right now but has announced intention is to do away with democracy, right? Um, so that's the, pol the political movements. The second are what are called jihadist local movements. These are local militant groups that are going to use military conflict to implement an Islamic state. So they're not going to go through a democratic process. They don't believe in that. They believe that the way to do it is through war. Uh, Hezbollah in Lebanon is a well-known public example. Um, the Jama'at Ism Islamiya in Pakistan, but that's an, that name Jama'at Islamiya is used by Muslim groups around the world that are uh, um, militant groups. The key thing I want you to understand about these movements is that they're local. They're not trying to control the world. They want to establish a political entity locally, right? They want their own little mo local Muslim state. But there are also the international jihadist groups, okay? And they want to establish something like the old Islamic Caliphate with its universal pretensions, its imperial pretensions. At the same time, they want to destroy modern Muslim civilization and culture because they regard that as the enemy of Islam. So we have to understand that the, the main, this, this is why when, you, know, you often hear that the biggest target of Islamic terrorism is fellow Muslims, and this is why. The ideology of ISIS, the ideology of Al-Qaeda, okay, is an ideology that says that the greatest danger to pure Islam is contemporary Islam. The West is over there. We'll get to them, right? The immediate problem is our impure Muslim neighbors. Okay? And that's why there's so Muslim, much Muslim on Muslim violence from the jihadis. I think, I think the latest statistic I read, and it's probably, it's hard to do this, something like for, for every one non-Muslim killed by a jihadist group, 15,000 Muslims are killed by the same group. Um, because you have no, the scale of violence doesn't make it to the West. It happens every day in Pakistan. It happens every day in Iraq. It happens every day in Iran, okay, in Syria. Um, it'll be interesting what happens in Syria with ISIS, but look, here we find the problem of being modern in a modern world. The only guy that can keep the Syrian country together turns out to be a really, really nasty dictator. Um, from a minority, from a minority sectarian group of Muslim heretics. So you have a really nasty dictator from a minority Muslim group ruling over a majority that hates his guts. That's why he needs a big army. But he can keep it together, right? Is he better than ISIS? <laughs> Good question. He arrests people and then kills them as opposed to just killing them. So what's the, you know, so yeah, it's a process thing. Okay. Non-Muslims non in modern Islam. So I've talked about these groups. Um, typically, the modern pietists and orthodox promote the idea that Islam should allow freedom of religion. Typically, the groups that identify as Puritan have narrowed the boundaries of religious freedom. So in relation to Christians and Jews, you have groups like Iran. Iran says that Christians and Jews may live freely in Iran as long as they are the Christians that live and Jews that lived in the time of the Prophet Muhammad. So no Protestants, no Pentecostals, only 
Roman Catholics and other old Christian groups, no Reformed Jews, no conservative Jews, only Orthodox Jews. Right? So they, their, their interpretation is the Quran says Christians and Jews are okay, but it's only the ones that Muhammad knew. Okay? Um, ISIS, the Taliban, um, Al Qaeda, their ideology, just as it dismisses all of Islam as being real Islam, dismisses all other religious groups as being really there too. So they're just they're saying it's a blank slate. Christians aren't really Christians, Jews are not really Jews, we can kill them all. Muslims are not really Muslims. Right? We can kill them all. Because nobody's pure enough for them. Um, you can find by the way, I'm not I hope you don't think I'm just making this up. It's relatively easy to find this literature. Okay. So, how are these Muslims going to get along in the middle world, in this modern world? A couple of efforts tell us the direction things are going. There was an effort called the Cairo Declaration of Human Rights. This happened in 1996, I believe. No Muslim country, no dominantly Muslim country has signed the United Nations Declaration of Human Rights. Okay? So Muslims were always being accused of you don't believe in human rights. So they came up with their own Cairo Declaration of Human Rights. Okay? The problem with that declaration is you don't even need to do a cursory reading of it, and you can look it up on the web if you wish, to see that it's an essentially non-modern document. It uses the word rights, but it pitches the term, the idea of rights in terms of obligations, which is the way non-modern societies understand it. So a woman doesn't have rights. Her husband has obligations. She can now talk about his obligations as if they were her rights, right? So if the husband's obligation is to support his wife financially, then you can say she has a right to be supported. Okay? But the basic idea is obligation on one party, not another. So if you say that um, I have a right to freedom of speech, no, the Muslim ruler has an obligation to let me speak freely as long as it does not denigrate Islam or go against his rule. Absolutely limited, right? Because his obligations are limited. Okay? Um, it is not based in the idea that religious people have a right to be religious. It's based in the idea that the Quran obliges Muslim rulers to let religious people live freely. You understand the difference, right? I don't own anything. He's actually the only person who owns everything. Okay. Um, so the 1990 Cairo Declaration was signed by all the member states of the Organization of the Islamic Conference, 57 Muslim countries. Um, by 2016, they knew that it wasn't working. Nobody was going to buy it. No, but for propaganda purposes, it was worthless. A 10-year-old could read it and go, that's not rights. I don't think that's what we mean by human rights. <laughs> okay? So the Islamic Society of North America, that's Canada and the United States primarily, instigated a years-long process throughout the Muslim world that brought delegates together in Marrakesh in 2016 and tried to come up with something new. The Marrakesh Declaration of, Declaration of 2016 was also signed by the leading Muslim authorities and government officials in all of these countries. So it's as important as a Muslim document as the Cairo Declaration was, but it's completely different. First of all, it states that the basic principles of, Muslims agreement, of Is Muhammad's agreement with the tribal confederation back in Mecca were the same principles that modern democratic societies are founded on. And therefore, Muslims can proceed to think in modern democratic terms. It asserts that Medina has all the principles of constitutional contractual citizenship. In other words, it has all the principles that a modern state citizenship are based on. And it calls upon Muslim <laughs> scholars to, quote, develop a jurisprudence of the concept of citizenship, which is inclusive of diverse groups. In other words, it, call, it doesn't pretend that the Muslim world is living mo in the modern world. <laughs> But it does say worldwide Muslim scholars should develop a political theory that is modern rather than pre-modern. Okay? And Muslim scholars have been working on that from before the time of the Marrakesh Declaration. Does it have a lot of legs? Well, we have to wait and see. Um, typically what makes nation states change the way they do things is that when the way they do things has failed so miserably that they have to change. Um, they, nations don't, don't easily just go, oh, I've got a bright new idea, let's implement it, <laughs> right? Um, and so uh, the intellectual groundwork is being laid across the Muslim world
to create modern Muslim states in which everybody has human rights and everybody has freedom of religion. But it takes a while. Um, uh, one of my favorite books, and I'll, the last slide is going to be self-obvious, is a book called Who, Who Needs an Islamic State Anyway? Um, and it was written in England by a guy that was kind of a, he was a hardcore Islamic statist until the Islamic State that he was living in kicked him out and threatened to kill him. And then he sort of reassessed <laughs> and said, you know what, maybe this Islamic State idea doesn't work so well because it doesn't actually allow intellectuals to think freely. But the beginning of the book is written by Zayuddin Sardar. Uh, Zayuddin Sardar is a Pakistani scholar who was a big name in Malaysia in the 1980s when I was there. He was like the most advanced. He led a group of Islamic political thinkers in Pakistan and North Africa. They were going to create the new Islamic world based on the old Quran, considered very advanced in Islamic thinking terms, wrote in English, by the way. And, um, but it was still the old pre-modern, we'll build a state from the Quran upward, right? Thinking. So Zayedin Sadar had to leave Pakistan before he got killed and moved to Germany and then to England. And he wrote the introduction of Who Needs an Islamic State? And again, here's a man who can reflect on his own experience. And one of the things he says is, in, the very, in his introduction to this book, is he said, every time I hear a Muslim scholar in Europe wax lyrical about the glories of an Islamic state, I simply invite him to move back home. <laughs> but he said, in the meantime, if you're in Europe because you enjoy European democracy and European human rights, then maybe you ought to be with us in thinking about a different way to have Muslim countries. Now, many Muslims that I talk to here in the United States, and I believe that would include the, the imam of your local mosque here, will say, as the Islamic Society of North America said, the Muslim world will now be led by the minority Muslim populations in the West because they're the only ones who have a free, the freedom to think about the future. That we, we, they don't expect leadership in the Islamic world to come from within the Islamic world. It's too hidebound, it's too traditional, it's too bound up in different political structures. So what about Muslims and Christians? We are uneasy neighbors. We remain uneasy neighbors. Um, we still fear the radicalized Muslim movements um, that result in international terrorism um, and the lead to denial of human rights for non-Muslims and Muslims alike. Muslims still fear that Christians are part of a corrupting modernity that wants to destroy the Islamic world. And I think we need to understand that. Most Muslims believe that what the United States wants to do is destroy them and that what Christians want to do is destroy their religion. We can say that's nonsense. We don't believe in that. We're, we're a liberal people here. We want to engage in dialogue. The more we do it, the better. The, but, you know, you live in the propaganda world you're in. Okay? There's, there's a couple of TV shows, TV stations you could watch here in the United States. That if you watch them 24-7, you'd believe that the Christians want to destroy Christianity. Right? So that's, that's the problem. So we live uneasily together. We live uneasily together right now. And I'm not sure where that's going to take us. I do want to do one thing, just the facts, ma'am. I'm not going to give all the slides. I'll send you the PowerPoint. I do want some realism about Islam in the United States. Muslim population growth is very rapid relative to the population growth of, of any Christian group except Mormons. There's about as many Mormons as there are Muslims, and they're growing at about the same rate. Nonetheless, maximum, if all the demographic projections pan out, Muslims will reach about 3% of the population of the United States in the year 2050. Um, the reason is that although they're, they're growing rapidly by birth, they are losing rapidly by their third and fourth generation Muslims leaving the church. Every Muslim imam in the Dallas-Fort Worth area has the same problem with youth that we have and wonders where they are. So you can, you can have many, many more babies, but if the babies don't ever come to the mosque, okay? And by the way, those, those families are going to have one child, two children, right? Same demographic things. Um, so that world, in Europe, it'll be different, though. Some European countries will have as many as a 20% Muslim population, which will be a big social challenge for them. Nobody has that many now, but some will. And that's a much bigger social challenge in Europe than we'll ever have in the United States. Worldwide, Islam will become 
uh, a religion about as big as Christianity sometime in the next 20 years. Um, uh, the Muslim rate of, ex there are fewer Muslims than Christians, but they are expanding more rapidly by birth. So there will be a parity, but in all likelihood, the parity will remain a parity for a long time because the population growth pressures will begin to come on the Muslim community as they have on the Christian community. Yeah? So the Sunnis and the Shiites are basically of no concern to Christians and Jews, etc. As far as that goes, the, it's just pretty much an internal strategy. The, the Sunni-Shiite thing is almost entirely internal. Um, within the United States, it makes almost no difference. The, the Sunnis, the Shiites would prefer to simply identify with the Muslim community if they identify with any community at all. American Muslims prefer not to be seen divided over this issue. It's an ancient political issue of no concern. Yeah? Earlier when you talked about the, the cities being broken up into quadrants, you, you differentiated between the Persians and the Muslims. Is yeah. that Shiites and Sunnis, or is that something? No, actually the Persians at this time were Zoroastrians. And um, the Zoroastrians were um, an ancient Persian religion that Islam decided was monotheistic. And so while Christians and Jews were acceptable, then Zoroastrians became acceptable. So you could have these four quadrants. Yeah. Okay, I know that, yeah? Did the, did the Mujahideen in um, Afghanistan turn into the Taliban? The, the Mujahideen is actually a larger name for groups that are, it just means armies of God, fighters for God. So the Taliban would be a specific group of them. Yeah. Um, I would love to recommend, there's a television show, it's about five or six years old from Canada, called Little Mosque on the Prairie. Mm-hmm. 30-minute situational comedy, but it's really funny. I watch, you can watch it all online, um, but it's from a Canadian broadcasting system. Um, but it is so funny, having worked in churches, to see how many of the issues when running a local school school system, how many of the issues are exactly the same for every single church. Yeah. It's really interesting. The first one, it's, yeah. It's a great show to watch. It's fun to watch. But it's also, I found it very right. enlightening in seeing modern Muslims and how they live out their lives in a modern society yeah. that... Yeah. If we if 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 a, if, a, if a pastor and an imam can get past the religious questions here in the U.S., they have all the same issues. It's you're running a religious community in a modern society that's vociferous. Youth are coming away. All of that. We we actually all have the same problems. Jews too, by the way. There's a there's a new book actually called How Can Jews, Muslims, and Christians Retain Their Youth? Because you know what. They're becoming Buddhists. So that's actually our common enemy. <laughs> it's the Buddhist meditation guys. Okay, listen, thanks a lot. I'm sorry I went too long.